Okay, welcome to the uh, 2020 special town meeting of fall, but being done virtually. I don't really have a lot of remarks tonight. The only remark is obviously it's a dark and stormy night. And a, <clears throat> there's part of Precinct 11 doesn't have power. Uh, I'm informed by Mr. Chapter Lane that about 500 homes are without power in Arlington but we have over 231 town meeting members in attendance. So we're gonna keep going. If for some reason uh, we should lose power and a lot of the town goes down, we're gonna figure out a way to continue the meeting till Wednesday. If I should lose power, um, obviously everyone will know because my little box will turn black. I am gonna try and log on with my phone and my uh, iPad and the Wi-Fi but, um, and try and keep the meeting going. So let's kind of just play that by ear. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, if the select board is still going, maybe Mr. Hurd can read Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Boskett can read Mr. Hurd's. Uh, I'm with you. Most, oh, you hear John? Good. Yep. I didn't see you down there. So Mr. Hurd? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020 at 8 p.m. That's you, Mr. Foskett. Uh, second. Sorry, I was on mute. Second. Oh, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Um, I'm going to direct the clerk to enter one vote in favor of that motion. Um, are there any announcements or resolutions? If anyone has an announcement or resolution, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom and we'll see if any of those come up. Okay. I'm not seeing any, no announcements or resolutions. Does anyone have any reports? Any uh, board or committee have a report they wish to uh, give to us at this time? Again, uh, get my attention by using the raise hand feature on Zoom if you have such a report. <clears throat> okay, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Foskett, if you could jump to number 11 on our agenda. Oh, skipping 10. Oh, yeah, you know, well, we don't have any reports or, uh, to accept at this point, so we don't have to do number 10. Okay. Uh, I move that article uh, 15 to 22 be laid upon the table. Okay. Julie Purcell, uh, precinct 12, second. Second. Okay, so town meeting members, um, we are laying 15 to 22 on the table. The speakers list from 15 is going to remain in the same order as we had before the other day, but we're taking 23 up and then 24. We're taking 23 up because the Capital Planning Commission does have a, a an hired expert who is going to be available for our question and answer if we should have any. So instead of making the um, gentleman hang around all night, we're going to bring that article up first. And then when we're done with 23, we're gonna go right to 24, the um, CPA article, because the tax rate is being set tonight after the town meeting and they need that CPA article to have been voted on for the tax rate. So I have um, a motion to table 15 through 22. It's been seconded. I'm gonna do a little unusual and ask if anyone is objecting to tabling those articles to please use the raised hand feature on Zoom. Mr. Charles, please. Yes, sir. Okay, we have, we're gonna do this in reverse. So I'm gonna take everyone who's objecting and then subtract them out from the number and do the math. So we have three, three people objecting to one person is objecting to uh, tabling the articles, so I'm going to rule 240 in favor, two objecting, 239 in favor, and one in abstain, so those articles are tabled. 
that now brings us to our, so Julia, uh, Ms. Wayman, you can get rid of the raised hand feature, thank you. That now brings us to Article 23. Um, Mr. Moderator, may yes, I close, close voting on the attendance? Oh, yes. I didn't even know it was still open. So let's close voting on, 20, on the attendance. Okay, Mr. Uh, Timur Yantar. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Timur Yantar, Precinct 7, and Chair, Capital Planning Committee. I rise to ask you to approve the recommended vote on Article 23, Capital Budget, DPW Yard. There is detail in the CPC report to town meeting and we are available to answer your questions after the video. Now a presentation video by the project design consultant, Jeff Alberti. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yantar. This presentation will provide an overview of Article 23 for the DPW Yard project. I would like to start by summarizing why the town needs a new and upgraded facility to support the DPW. For starters, a majority of the buildings were built in the early 1900s. They've seen no significant improvements since the 1970s, and the DPW responsibilities have increased significantly over that time. As a result, the facilities no longer serve the needs of the DPW, they are no longer code compliant, and this impacts efficiency of operations as well as employee safety. These next few photos show some of the substandard conditions in the existing facilities that we plan to address, from building envelope deficiencies, to inadequate space for the vehicle maintenance operations, to inadequate space for the staff, as you can see, locker rooms are located within the lunch rooms, to inefficient and unsafe workshops. Also, due to inadequate space, a large portion of the multi-million dollar fleet is left outdoors, which impacts the life expectancy of the vehicles and increases maintenance costs. Using the information from our inspections of the existing facilities, we began the programming analysis in 2017 for DPW and ISD. We later added facilities and IT operations into the mix, developed numerous concepts, selected a preferred concept, and completed an initial estimate. This is the initial estimate that was completed in 2018, and it did include one year of escalation for an initial construction cost of approximately $25.5 million. We included soft costs at about $2.8 million, as well as owner and construction contingencies for a total project cost of just under $30 million. I would like to spend a few minutes talking about what has changed since 2018 that has necessitated the need for the request in Article 23. For starters, when we began the project, it was initially viewed as a DPW facility project. As mentioned earlier, we added the facilities and IT departments into the program when it was decided to relocate these operations out of the high school and into the DPW site. As we began to coordinate with the high school design team, we realized there was much more to consider from an overall municipal campus perspective, including providing vehicular access between the sites as shown by the red arrow and planning for a future potential third means of access to the high school at this location. The planning also included accounting for pedestrian access between the two sites to allow students to access the adjacent recreation facilities on Grove Street as shown by the blue dotted line. In order to properly incorporate these considerations, the pace of the DPW design had to be slowed so that, that the proper data could be gathered and coordinated with the high school team and then the plans adjusted to accommodate these changes. Some of the other changes that occurred since 2018 included changing the project delivery method from design bid build to construction manager at risk 
to better manage the risks associated with a complex project. With that change came increased project contingencies to include a guaranteed maximum price contingency. And also we included some scope changes through the normal development of design. These changes were primarily related to the comprehensive development of programming needs for the facilities and IT departments, which are being relocated from the high school to the DPW site as described earlier. So where are we today? This plan provides an overview of the current project. On the right hand side, you can see the four buildings that will be renovated for IT facilities and DPW vehicle and equipment storage. And on the left hand side, you can see the new operations building for DPW and ISD, as well as a new salt storage structure. This is an overall rendering of the new operations building for DPW and ISD. You can see the main entrance located along Grove Street directly behind the individual shown in the image on your screen. Utilizing the latest design documents, we worked with the construction manager to develop a new up-to-date cost estimate this past October. This estimate identified a total construction cost of just under $34 million. We factored in approximately $3.2 million in soft costs, as well as owner contingencies and construction contingencies for a total project cost of approximately $38.9 million. We compared that to the 2018 estimate of approximately $30 million and identified an $8.9 million increase. The factors contributing to this increase are listed below. They include a schedule extension associated with the high school planning exercise mentioned earlier, an unforeseen 2019 market spike, which saw costs rise at a significant pace due to a competitive market in 2019, a change to the alternate delivery method, increased contingencies, as well as enhanced building renovations, as mentioned earlier, primarily for facilities in IT. It's important to note that the approach used on this project is a fiscally sound and responsible approach, especially when compared to what other communities are doing. This chart graphs actual costs per square foot for DPW facility projects through 2019 with costs escalated beyond 2019 at a standard rate of approximately 4%. As we add in the cost of the Arlington project, based on today's estimate, projected out to 2021, you can see that there is a significant savings on a cost per square foot basis. This savings is directly attributable to the fact that we are renovating and reusing four buildings on the existing site as shown below. Another fiscally sound decision was to relocate the facilities and IT departments from the high school to the DPW site. If they were to be constructed in the high school, they would literally be off the charts as shown here when compared to DPW facility costs. By incorporating them into the DPW site and renovating existing structures, the town is able to save approximately $2.5 million. Finally, one item that has not been reflected in any of the estimates but is worth mentioning is that we're starting to see some potential savings, a dip if you will, in the current market due to the economic slowdown. While we're not sure how long this dip will last, we're hopeful that by advancing the project now, we will be able to take advantage of some of the savings we are seeing. Thank you for listening in. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Yontar? No, thank you, Mr. Moderator, we're done. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Mevin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Zarina Mevin, precinct. I want to know, since this is going to be for a, a, a borrowing for fiscal year 2022, when is it expected to, the project expected to start and how long is it going to take to finish? Do we have an idea? I, I wasn't clear on all this. Mr. Yontar, can you have, do you have that answer? Yes. Um, the design will be complete at the end of this year. Uh, the town expects to sign a guaranteed maximum price in March of next year, and site mobilization will begin in April. And we believe the project will take uh, two consecutive phases, lasting 16 months and eight months. So estimated completion is April 2023. Okay. That's all I have for now. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Mehmet. Uh, Mr. Gordon Jameson. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, anyone who was a uh, town meeting member when Mr. Rodemaker first presented the, uh, the initial, um, before the additions uh, presentation, realized that this is a very difficult site on a very constrained piece of land. Um, underneath it are toxic, toxic waste from the gas plant that used to be there. Um, there's a DPW sewer line, and there's also the mill, mill the uh, floodplain slash the mill um, river stream goes underneath this project. So it's quite com complex, and, and in the past, uh, those things have consorted to flood some of the lower areas towards the back of the pro of the property, um, impacting um, the the equipment that we have. That most of which. Um, against standard ways things are done these days, um, are housed outdoors. So this this is this is the dump basically. But one of the largest departments that impacts us all every day. They were out working in the park behind me today. Has an absolute pit of a facility to work in. We've done our fire. We've done our police. We've done our schools. It's time to do our DPW. Um, I'm also very excited that the IT and facilities departments are being co-localized with the DPW. This is because increasingly those will be, um, uh, their ability to work effectively will be augmented by being close to the DPW, as well as for the IT and facilities, also close to the largest building in town, the, the new high school. So, um, I uh, understand that, that this was, so my only disappointment was that when this was presented to us um, a couple of years ago at a town meeting, that there was not more work done, but um, that was necessitated by the changes in the high school project until the high school project was finalized. There was really no way to go forward with this project. So I asked my fellow members to enthusiastically support the people that take care of us um, they, street the, they sweep the streets, they clean out the drains, they plow and sand the streets, uh, especially when winter is coming up. And, and for the most part, the work they do, you really don't notice, and that's the good thing. Um, so please vote yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. Stephen Revelak. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Revelak, Precinct 1. Uh, I have just a, a few questions. During the presentation, we were told that the um, you know, sort of pro project methodology was being changed from, I believe, design and build to construction manager at risk. Uh, would it be possible to get an explanation of what those methodologies are and why we changed? Uh, Ms. Deontar? Kim Morkai Yantar, Capital Planning Chair. I'm going to defer to uh, one of our my colleagues. Um, I'm not sure if Mike Rademacher or if uh, Alan Reedy would be the appropriate one to uh, answer. Uh, Mr. Rademacher's on. We can promote Mr. Reedy, but Mr. Rademacher, can you answer that question? Uh, sure, I can um, take a stab. And if, uh, if our consultant wants to add anything, I, I guess I can ask. Um, okay, but essentially, um, we originally were going to be building this as a uh, design a bid build, where you put a set of plans together and then um, ask contractors to bid on them, and you take the lowest bidder, and at that point, you live with the plans you have and the contract you have, and you are often open to um, to. Uh, issues with your drawings that the contractors can peel apart and, and take advantage of. The methodology we are working is a, um, a contract manager at risk where you bring a contract manager in as part of the design and ask that they help develop the plans 
to minimize any kinds of surprise, any surprises you might find during construction where the contractor assumes that risk because they've been part of the design process. We have used this successfully, or the town has, on a few projects. I believe the Gibbs School, uh, uh, one of them, and it's been very advantageous, especially a project as complicated as Public Works, where it's a, a historical buildings and a contaminated site and the, and the issues we have. And so it was determined that the, by the, uh, the PTBC and uh, the design team that this was the more appropriate way to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. Mr. Chaplin, did you have something to add to that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Adam Chapdelain, town manager. Uh, Mr. Rademacher answered that extremely well. I would only add that the high school is also being procured under that same model. So uh, as Mr. Rademacher said, the Gibbs school was performed in this manner, constructed in this manner, the high school will be, as will the DPW. Very good, thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Revelak. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so given that I, I realize this is a complex site um, and the facility itself, um, you know, there's a lot going on between, you know, it, not just with DPW and DPW's many needs, but also incorporating the facilities and IT department. So, I mean, this, that sounds like a, 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 a reasonable choice. As, um, you know, the consultant said in his video presentation, uh, the buildings on this site were built in the turn of the 20th century. They have not had significant upgrades since the 1970s. And to me, this is work that is long overdue. And I'm hoping that um, we will vote yes on this article tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Uh, David Levy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, David Levy, uh, Precinct 18. I just have one comment uh, and then a question. I, it should be noted in the 2019 uh, capital planning report where this project was first approved, um, both things that were sort of referenced in the cost increase uh, were referenced in this capital planning report that uh, summed up to $32.2 million. For one, the IT and the facilities groups were contemplated. That's on um, paragraph four of the campus renovation. And then in addition, the DPW project has been arranged in order to allow connection from our high school to Grove Street should that, desired be, should that be desired in the final design. So a lot of the contemplations in this cost increase are already discussed in the 2019 capital plan planning report that uh, produced the $32.2 million cost estimate uh, that was approved um, at that time. Uh, I do have a question, uh, and I don't know who the appropriate person is, Mr. Iyer, but for the $8.9 million additional appropriations being asked, how will that be funded um, if approved? Bonding. We're gonna, Bonding. Borrow, we're gonna borrow the money. Okay, so that'll be debt service over 20 years. Uh, Mr. Rodemaker. Actually, this is Timor. Timor Yontar. Yes, yep. Timor Yontar, Chair of Capital Planning Committee. Um, that's correct. It will be bonded. We anticipate uh, over a 30 year period. Um, <clears throat> and with interest rates being extremely low right now, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's a great time to borrow. So um, we, we expect that, that will cause a um, uh, roughly a $400,000 uh, annual debt service payment. Okay, so then do you have an estimate for the amount of increase in property taxes that will, for each household that will? I do, I do. The answer is zero. And the reason for that is that the capital budget is fixed in size. It was sized at 5% of the overall town budget. So this project and all of our capital projects and capital assets, um, trucks, police cars, et cetera, must fit into that budget. So what this does mean is it, it's, uh, $400,000 per year, uh, which is about 4.6% of the current capital budget. Mm -hmm. um, that portion um, will not be available for other capital projects. We'll have to, you know, squeeze this in by uh, either, you know, deprioritizing other, other things or reducing the expenditure or delaying them. Okay, so you are going on record now to say that we are not going to, that other, the cuts will come out of the capital plan 
in the 2021 town meeting uh, to make way for this cost increase. I am going on the record to say that this is not going to increase your taxes and it will all fit in the capital plan with no increase in taxes. That's right. Wow. This is like uh, this. this is awesome. Um, okay. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Uh, Scott Lieber. Mr. Levy, you can unmute yourself. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Scott Lever, Precinct 8. Has there been an evaluation of the potential to contract out more services in this area to reduce the footprint and reduce the capital requirements? Uh, that's a little beyond the scope of the article, but I'll ask Mr. Chapdelaine to give us a very quick answer on that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chaplin, Town Manager. Yeah, I, I would say on an ongoing basis, both the manager's office in cooperation with the director's office, the director of public works' office, are considering where it might be more advantageous to, uh, to contract out services. Um, I'm not sure that's widely known. We do contract out uh, lawn maintenance services in the cemetery. We contract out a great deal of our tree work to supplement the work of our tree department, uh, along with uh, other contracted work for more construction related projects. If, you, if you're asking me today, if I thought there was a lot of room for reduction via contracting with the response times that we get from our own staff, I'd say we're, I think we're right up against how much we can contract, but, um, but we do look at it on an ongoing basis to determine if there are some services that we can, uh, could contract. I, I can't cite for you on a per capita basis right now, you know, where we are staffing wise. Um, but my, my general understanding and comparing us to other communities is we are a, a relatively either moderately or maybe even lower than moderately staffed DPW as compared to similar communities. Yeah. Um, can I ask about the, the IT portion of this? Is the IT build including a data center or any other specialized construction? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Rodemaker or Mr. Alberti? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The, the question is, in the IT component of the bill, is there a data center or other specialized construction, or is it primarily office space for staff? Uh, the uh, IT department server room data center will be relocated to this facility. Okay. Has there been an evaluation of moving that equipment to a cloud service provision model? Well, I don't want to speak for the, direct, the IT director. I know that he does a lot of that, and there are some things I believe that are more advantageous to have uh, locally. Uh, again, I don't I want to speak for the IT director, but I know that he's working toward that. Mr. Good, can you answer that? Mr. Good? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. Uh, we currently host uh, a variety of uh, uh, core applications in the cloud. Uh, we strive to keep a balance of other strategic elements uh, uh, local and then some number of those uh, hosted. The, the crux of the matter is the core network infrastructure, which currently resides in the high school which will be moved permanently to the DPW building is probably the most important asset we have. It, it furnishes connectivity, wired and wireless, to every building in the town, including schools. So the uh, reason for sort of a secure location with uh, conditioned environments uh, it, it is, is sort of a reason for having that server room relocated and built uh, in, in the DPW building. One, one final question. How many of the staff, or how, how much, how, let's see how to, how to position this question. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of this facility is for 
um, for staff who might otherwise be located at some other commercial office space within town, especially given vacancy rates of uh, uh, commercial real estate in Arlington right now? So we do have IT staff that are uh, located in some of the buildings around the town. There's uh, 22 people, uh, both in the town and school group. Uh, and I would say seven of those uh, employees are housed in uh, town or school buildings currently. Mm. Sorry, Mr. Good, that, that was meant to be a broader question uh, around the whole facility. Oh, okay, sorry about that. No, no, that's okay, I appreciate that part. So Mr. Good, I think the question is, can we step, put any of the IT staff into a commercial real estate as opposed to the new uh, facilities you intend to build? Correct, Mr. Lever? Yes, that's right. Okay. Or has that been explored at all? We've looked uh, around town, but I think that the um, ability to keep um, the group together as one uh, a core group uh, sort of moved us towards uh, looking uh, at, at the DPW uh, uh, site as being the location where we would house about 75% of those folks. Thank you. Thank well, you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Lever. Is it Lever or Lever? Lever. But Mr. Either. Lever. Thank you, Mr. Lever. Um, Carolyn Murph Murray? Hi, Caroline Murray, Precinct 12. I raised my hand in anticipation of a question I thought was going to come, but I'll just answer it in case somebody's thinking it. Um, I'm a construction professional. I have 20 years of experience in the area, and I just wanted to confirm that the uh, CM at risk approach versus design build is the responsible way to move forward here. And the escalation um, that was noted in the presentation is basically right on the money. And as far as any savings that are potential um, for any, you know, um, recession or market change um, will probably be realized at the end of 2021. So planning now is the best way we can take advantage of that. Thank you, Mr. Roderick. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Alexander Bilski. Alexander Bilski, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on the article and all matters before it. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilski. Um, Second. Thank you very much, Mr. Foskett. We have a motion to terminate debate. And it's not debatable, so we're going to go right to the vote to terminate debate. So town meeting members, um, when you see the voting grid, Precincts uh, 1 through 7, navigate over to the portal, refresh and start your vote. After a few seconds, 8 through 14, please navigate over, refresh your page and start your vote. And now uh, the remaining precincts, 8 through 20, uh, 15 through 21, please navigate over and start your vote. If you're having trouble voting, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom in order to um, bring it to our attention that you can have any trouble voting. And if you're phoning in your vote, please call Ms. Brazil at her office phone number, 781-316-3071. I know there are at least one town meeting member who is not um, able to make a good connection with the internet, so she will be phoning in her vote. So this is on the motion to terminate debate. Uh, we've had 228 voting. There are 16 who have not voted yet. And we have nobody raising hands. Okay, so the last 11, if you have, please go ahead and vote. It's down to nine. We're gonna give you another couple seconds to vote. We've gotten much better at voting. Uh, we're voting a lot quicker than we were the first two nights. So after about a minute, we're already down to nine members who haven't voted. Uh, Sylvia Domin Dominguez, Patricia Muldoon, Christian Klein, 
Daniel Jelkett, Stephanie Ford Weems, uh, Lynette Culverhouse, she, she's having tr trouble, so she's probably going to phone in. Lynette, if you could phone in your vote. Sherry Barron, and we have just three people left. All right, let's um, let's close voting. Motion passes. By 91%, we have 217 in favor of terminating debate. We have 22 no's. That's a vote. And I so declare it, debate is terminated. There were some requests if we could do away with uh, running through the screens after each vote. Uh, we can't actually because part of the enabling legislation along with uh, requiring us to show everyone who is waiting on the speakers list also shows, uh, makes us show everybody how they voted so you can confirm what your vote is. So we do have to put up with it. We've got that down to eight seconds a page. So it doesn't really take too long. It takes about 30 seconds total. So we can bear with that. And when that's done, Mr. Kowalski will open the main motion as printed in the capital planning Budget Capital Planning Committee report. So now we have the main motion of the Capital Planning Committee to spend $8.9 million by borrowing to spend on the town yard so we can complete the construction. So precincts one through eight will jump on over to the portal. Refresh if you need to. Mr. Foskett has a point of order. Mr. Foskett. Mr. Moderator, I believe this requires a two-thirds vote. Yes, it does, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And if the rest of the page, oh, see, we just had it. All he had to do was refresh. We've had some uh, hardware upgrades, so it should work a lot quicker for everybody. So if 8 through 21 can go over and start voting. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. Uh, our vote, as Mr. Foskett mentioned, actually in the system is listed as a majority vote. Well, it's a two-thirds vote, so I'm going to do the math. If, yeah. Yeah, anything with bonding is a two-thirds vote. So um, please click one for yes, two for no, and then click cast your vote. If you're having trouble voting, please use raise hand feature on Zoom. We have 16 people who haven't voted yet. So if those last few people can go ahead and vote. Okay, uh, Deborah Butler, Michael Quinn, and Nada El Nuawi. I know I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Go ahead and vote. We're going to close voting in 15 seconds. <clears throat> we got five seconds left to vote. And everyone has now voted. So let's close voting. We have 248 members voting. It's a 98% mar 96% margin. We have 237 in the yes. We have nine no. It's a two thirds vote. I so declare it. And that closes article 23. Once we run through the screens.
Okay, we're going to close out Article 23, and that's going to bring us to Article 24. Appropriation for the Community Preservation Fund. First up will be Mr. Eric Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12 and Chair of the CPA Committee. I believe there's a video presentation. Yes, there is. Thank you very much. I'm Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee, here to talk about Article 24. Article 24 asks town meeting to fund three CPA projects for the current fiscal year. We approved these projects for the annual town meeting earlier this year, but we decided to postpone them because they were less time sensitive and we wanted to keep that meeting as short as possible. The projects are now ready to proceed and we're here tonight asking for your support. Each of these projects fall under the open space and recreation category of CPA funding and they're sponsored by the Town Department of Planning and Community Development. The Minuteman Bikeway Planning Project is a major study of the long-range needs of this important transportation corridor and recreation resource. It would develop a shared community vision and action plan using heavy community involvement at every step of the way. It would provide a prioritized list of infrastructure upgrades with conceptual designs, laying the groundwork for future grant applications to fund the work. The next project is the Arlington Archaeological Reconnaissance Survey. Prior CPA funding has helped the planning department identify a number of undocumented archaeological resources that may be of significant value. The survey would lay the groundwork to protect them if necessary. The final list of sites is to be determined, but the town is looking at Prince Hall Cemetery, industrial areas along Millbrook and Spy Pond, town-owned recreation areas, and others. The town is applying for matching funding from the state, and if successful, this funding would reduce the need for CPA funds. Finally, the documentation of town-owned historic and municipal resources. This would fund the completion of the detailed documentation that's required for town-owned properties that could qualify for historic preservation grant funding, but before the town can apply for those funds, there's some detailed work that needs to be done to document each property. These are landscapes, buildings, and burial grounds. And in addition to availing the town of access to grant funds for preservation, this work would also provide the town with a valuable planning tool when assessing building conditions and establishing maintenance, renovation, or expansion plans. Thank you very much for your consideration, and we're happy to answer any questions. And Mr. Monroe, this is Eric Helmuth, once again, Chair of the CPA Committee. I just want to make a quick correction to my recorded presentation. Um, I incorrectly stated that all three projects were under the Open Space and Recreation Project. The Minuteman Bikeway Planning Project is, and the other two are obviously historic preservation. Oh, very good. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth, for that correction. Do you have anything further to uh, add to your presentation? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Nancy Bloom wishes to speak. Uh, Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Uh, Mr. Moderate, I had a couple of questions about this. Sure. One was, um, will there be any, for the Miniman Bikeway uh, study, will there be any liaison with other towns? that also have the Minimum Bikeway in their towns? Either Mr. Helmuth or Ms. Rake? Uh, Eric Helmuth, Chair of the CPA Committee. The answer is uh, yes. Um, and if, uh, if Jenny Rake is on, I think she can um, elaborate. Yes, Ms. Rake is on. Good evening. 
Jennifer Raitt, Director of Planning and Community Development. Yes, we will be engaging with our budding communities along the bikeway. Okay, thank you. And my second question has to do with a different study. It's the one, the Documentation of Historic Municipal Resources. And it mentions there'll be, that uh, the project will include looking at older school buildings. Will that include some of the older school buildings that have been sold by the town um, and are now used for say condos or is that totally off the board? Um, either Ms. Reid or Ms. Helmuth. Uh, Eric Helmuth, GP CPA Chair. Um, so the list of the school buildings is as follows. The Bishop School, Brackett, Dallin, Hardy, Hearst, Stratton, Thompson, the Gibbs, the Audison, and the DPW building. So um, that's the complete list of schools that we have. Um, Ms. Ray can correct me if there are any others. Okay, so none of the schools that are no longer owned by the town. That's right. The, yes, this project is for only for town-owned projects. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Um, Ms. Ms. Memon? Yes, this is the moderator, Serena Mellon, PC21. I have just want a clarification on the presentation. It said APS. I'm not very good with these, um, this abbreviation. Can we just get what that means? It was on one of the last slides. And I don't see it on the report and the recommended vote for Community Preservation Act. I would assume Arlington Public Schools, but I'll have oh, Mr. Helmuth correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, maybe it's the Archaeological Consensus sur Survey? I don't know. Could we have Eric, uh, Mr. Yes, Helmuth? Yes, Mr. Helmuth. Hi, Eric Helmuth, CPA Chair. Yes, it's Arlington Public Schools. My apologies. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. John Warden. Yeah, you're on, you're on, you're on uh, Mr. Warden. I on. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct K. Two questions. In that list of school the schools, or properties owned by the town, um, the rattled off. Uh, um, I didn't hear the parameter. Did I miss that, or is that not included for some reason? Parameter is no longer used as school. It's now used as a, for for bit, uh, babysitting while the high school is under construction. So I understand it. Yes, it's a monotony preschool. Uh, Mr. Helmuth, are you going to look at the power mentor? It, it is not on the list. Um, if you wanted to know the rationale, you need to, uh, we need to get uh, information from Ms. Ray. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, second question. Uh, in some of the pictures that flashed across the screen during the presentation, I saw the, the, um, uh, the facade of the column building at the high school, which has been the symbol of the high school for the past 90 years. Uh, I wonder if there's uh, any uh, study or plan to preserve at least that little slice of Arlington's history. There's none that I'm aware of. Curious is still writing a picture then, isn't it? Yes. But is Mr. Helms going to answer that? Yeah, Eric, I, I, is the CPA going to preserve the facade of the column house? Uh, Eric Helms, CPA chair, uh, the column house is not on the list of buildings for the historic inventory. Okay. Should be. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, Priya Sankalia. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Priya Sankalia, Precinct 13. I had a question about the archaeological uh, survey um, section of the presentation. Would those be sites that um, are expecting some construction that are going to be surveyed for archaeological remains? Mr. Helmuth or Ms. Raitt? I'd suggest Ms. Raitt to take that on. Okay. Jennifer Raitt, Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, no, they are not uh, locations where we would anticipate any sort of construction. Uh, they are simply sites that have been identified that are either uh, currently, you know, recreation owned uh, locations um, or um, locations such as the Millbrook, 
um, and other sort of landscapes in town that we are looking to do some archaeological research as uh, was uh, identified as part of the survey master plan, which was a master plan that was conducted looking at all different types of historic preservation opportunities in town and identified the need to do some archaeological reconnaissance on specific locations in town, uh, not ones where we would anticipate any sort of construction um, of new buildings or such. Uh, these are landscapes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Ms. Sincalia? No, thank you, Mr. Margarita. Thank That's you. Fine. Mr. Mark McCabe. Mavis report. Did that come through? You know, um, start again, Mr. McCabe. Please. I'll start again. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 24 in all matters before it. Very good. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. We've missed you up You're to welcome. now. Um, <clears throat> Mr. McCabe has made a motion to terminate Second. debate. It's been seconded by Mr. Foskett. non-debatable motion once Mr. Kurowski brings up the voting grids. Um, so the first uh, half of the town, please go over. So precincts one through seven, please go over to the voting portal, refresh your page. Then precinct eight through 14, please navigate over, refresh your page. And 15 through 21 can go over now and refresh your page. Then please vote one for yes to terminate debate, two for no to keep the debate going, and then click cast your vote. And if you're having a voting issue, please use the raised hand feature on Zoom. Um, we have a couple. Uh, Susan McCabe has her hand up. Del Krauss and Miss Pam Hallett. So let's see, Miss McKay, what, you're having a voting issue. Uh, that was a, an error. I hit that an error. I'm totally fine. Okay, go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Del Krauss. Miss Krauss, are you having a voting issue? Julie Brazil, town clerk. Uh, I have Adele's verbal vote. Oh, okay. Yeah, she raised her hand somehow. I'm not sure how she did that. And then Pam Hallett. Ms. Hallett, did you have a voting issue? Ms. Hallett, you can unmute yourself and vote or tell us what the issue is so we can help you. Okay, while well, we wait to Ms. Hallett, um, eight people have not voted. It looks like PM's put her hand down. Okay, and she still hasn't voted though. So um, <clears throat> seven members have not voted on the termination of the bait. If you could please do so now, Robert. Tossi, Pam Hallett, Jennifer Seuss, Ian Thompson, and Joanne Preston. Those four people could go, and Len Carden. Okay. Pam, if you have an issue voting, please uh, let us know somehow. We have, okay, let's give these last three people 15 seconds. Oh, Ms. Hallett entered a verbal vote. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Hallett. So join Preston and Len Carden. Go ahead and vote. You have 10 seconds. Five. And time's up. Let's close voting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Motion to terminate debate is successful. 
89%. We have 210 in the affirmative. 27, no. So debate is terminated. <clears throat> After we run through the screens, we'll take a vote on the main article. Mr. Moderator? Yes, ma'am. Um, maybe uh, we can remind town meeting members that if they're having trouble voting, they can also call the town clerk. Ah, yes, thank you very much. I forgot to do that. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Mm -hmm. So we'll yeah. enter that number into the chat for folks. Okay, and Mr. Godsell tells us that power is now back on in precinct 11. That's good news. Okay, we're gonna open up voting on the main article 24, the CP CPA Community Preservation Act fund a request to spend. Uh, $175,200 on the funds as Mr. Helmuth uh, told us about. So voting is now open. So precincts one through seven, one through eight, please navigate over to this, your voting portal. Precincts eight through 15 can navigate over now. And 15 through 21, go ahead and navigate over. Please refresh if you need to. We're taking our vote. So one for yes in favor of the recommended vote of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Two for no if you don't want to spend this money. And then click cast your vote. If you're having a voting issue, please either use the raise hand feature on Zoom or call Ms. Brazil, 781-316-3071. Okay, we have 10 folks who haven't voted yet. If those people can go ahead and do that. Well, one for yes, two for no, and then click cast your vote. Joanne Preston, Ethan Zimmer, Brian Rearig, Caroline Murphy, Murray. So if those four people want to go ahead and vote. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Um, Adam, there is a request to show your voting screen and not the article. Thank you. Yeah, we typically show the voting results once they're ready and the article during the voting period. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, because all it's showing is who has voted and who has not. So at this point, um, only Joanne Preston and Ethan Zimmer have not voted. So if they're going to vote, I'm going to give them 15 seconds to vote and we're going to close voting. And all verbal votes have been entered. So you have three seconds to vote and time's up. Let's close voting. And the main motion passes by a vote of 98%. We have 236 in the affirmative and six in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it. That ends Article 24. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. I move that uh, Articles 15 to 22 be taken from the table. Second. Okay. I'm going to ask the clerk to direct to um, town clerk to enter one vote in favor of that motion. That really leaves us nothing else to do if we don't, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And that will bring us back to Article 15 once we go through the screens. Now, this is the grand experiment. We're going to see if 
all the uh, speaker, speaker list has been preserved. And it did. Look at that. It worked. We had some internal debate whether it would work or not. It looks like Mr. Krause, you made sure it did. Thank you, Adam. All right. So we're back to the speakers list on 15 home rule legislation, retired police officer details. Um, I did know that the town manager uh, circulated a question and answer sheet today, about two pages long. I hope you all had a chance to read that. Miss um, Memon, Serena Memon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Serena so Memon, Precinct 21. Um, so I wanted to start out with good evening, Mr. Moderator, town officials, and town, fellow town meeting members. I hope that you had a splendid holiday and are staying dry and warm on this chilly, windy evening. I rose my hand to speak on Article 15 because um, even as this, uh, though this article is highly charged, I feel as an elected town representative, I feel it's my duty, and as a color, person of color, it's my duty to bring up my concerns. So I went through this methodically and I'm sorry if I'm going to probably hit the time marker on this but bear with me um, since there's a lot that was presented um, by many people. I reviewed the, the lengthy um, documents uh, including the one from today that was sent out with the uh, frequently asked questions prepared by the town manager, police chief, and the legal department. I'm left with these concerns. First, um, the title, the <clears throat> special police officer, why, cho why choose that title? Uh, why not a detail fla uh, flagger, de detail uh, <clears throat> a police flagger, police flagger itself, or just a, civil, uh, just a flagger, period. Since this is not a police duty, I feel it's more gentler to have a title that better serves the town. Second is on crime. I felt that the financial committee report stated that the crime has gone down in our community. So why do we need the people who are directing traffic to carry a gun? Um, you know, I understand in Britain, uh, watching for Zakaria, that they, they police officers don't even carry a gun and our military, uh, our police departments militarize almost. Um, so it's pretty scary, but now, um, so I think we have to consider this greatly and nationally, locally, people of color are asking for reduced police department footprints. And this article does exactly the opposite. It increases the size of our police department um, at a time when our crime rates are down. This doesn't make sense. Um, and as a, as a woman of color and as an Arlington resident for over 20 years, I, feel, I truly feel that this matter a detail uh, can and should be handled better again. Next one is um, about the FinCom report. Uh, a recent FinCom report on Arlington Police Department shows the majority of calls to the APD are for behavioral, mental health and substance abuse and do not involve crimes. This is a significant finding and is evidence enough that both active and retired police officers need to receive mandated continued training in community policing or diversity and bias issues such as cultural diversity, bias training, uh, implicit bias, G, uh, LGBTQ, suicide prevention, ADL law enforcement seminar, procedural justice, implicit bias, recognizing symbols of hate, as well as de-escalation, fair and impartial policing and mental health first aid. Next one is on language. It makes sense that, that we provide our active and retired police officers training that they need to respond to a majority of services, service calls received. This bylaw does not contain language that specifically requires a training. While I understand that chief can mandate training, I'm uncomfortable that is not specified in this bylaw. Next uh, <clears throat> concern is uh, amount of work and civilian flaggers. So it has been already elucidated that previ by previous speakers that there's more detailed work than the police department can, Arlington Police Department can handle, which makes me wonder why are we not using civilian flaggers like the one, uh, like other states uh, or other communities are. I have driven by, I have driven many times across to the middle of the country since my in-laws live in Michigan 
and, um, and through Canada, and notice high use of non-police detail on both highways and non-highway road products, projects. Perhaps we are reluctant to change our ways in detailing in Massachusetts, but I think this is a highly worthwhile goal that we may consider changing our procedures and maybe we're even behind standard operating procedures elsewhere in uh, other communities in North America. My next comment is on economics of this. Economics is speaking um, with a high rate of unemployment. I would like to see local residents who are also familiar with Arlington to be able to apply for these jobs as flaggers because it does have a high lucrative pay. Retired police officers could also apply for this work. I'm not saying they shouldn't. Um, contracts is the next point. Regarding contracts, uh, why are there two police unions? I, I don't understand that. Um, we're always going to be negotiating contracts, and so this shouldn't be a roadblock to forward thinking on this matter. Uh, next point is <clears throat> clarifying um, through uh, frequently asked questions today. Uh, it says that civilian flaggers would not result in, a, in, a, in appropriate, appreciable savings to the town. Another way to phrase this is that civilian flaggers would not cost the town any more than um, Arlington Police Department flaggers. But it would not start us, uh, it would start us in a process of shifting uh, spending to where it's actually needed, especially as Arlington is facing an impending need for another override. My next point is on cost saving for our community. Civilian flaggers are paid an average of $46 and some cents per hour, while police officers paid $51 and some cents per hour. Um, the, Another potential area cost is saving, uh, cost savings that civilian flaggers are only paid for the actual time work. Uh, Article 4 of the collective bargaining agreement states that regardless of how many hours they are actually worked, officers are paid minimum four hours per detail and at least, and after eight hours they're paid time and a half. Um, and since these are going to be retired police officers, there's no this mandate, they have to be 16 hours or whatever restrictions that are listed in one of the frequently um, asked questions. Another um, a point I have is inclusiveness. Um, other communities like Lexington permit, permit civilian flaggers, including some of our retired Arlington Police Department officers. This is more inclusive, this is a more of an inclusive approach that allows both retired police officers and civilians, civilians to pursue these jobs and avoid arming flaggers. Voting no on this article, <clears throat> we're more uh, easily allowed to uh, Arlington pursue this option of encouraging retired police officers to apply for civilian flagger jobs as well. Focus on the job. We should not rely on officers working overtime at construction details to also be forced- Ms. Simon, Ms. Memon, your time's up. Oh, okay. Can I just conclude or no? Uh, you could give you five seconds. Okay, so I just think that uh, the the guns, um, as well as the uh, the requirements of training and so forth, is going to be more cost prohibitive than cost saving, and I think we should go with civilian flaggers, as well as for diversity and inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Bevan. Um, Mr. Alan Tosti. Mr. Tost, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alan Tosti, Precinct 17. I urge the support for this common sense proposal to put recently retired Arlington police officers on our streets instead of out of town police who don't know our town. After reading this article in motion, I don't know why anyone would have a problem with this. After hearing the opponents of this article, I still think our town meeting should support this article in motion. The town manager and police chief said that they support uh, police at detail work for three reasons. It expands the police presence in our town. It supports the take home pay of officers, our employees, approximately 20% that is paid for by private utilities, not the town taxpayer. And three, it provides good value of service to the community, 
are sound reasons. Let's look at each. It expands the police presence. One of the opponents claims that people don't want more police on the streets. I think this does not make sense and is not true. I have never seen a survey or a poll that supports this claim from the people in the neighborhoods, whatever neighborhood it is. Common sense says that police presence deters lawbreakers, whether it's robbery and heart crime or speeding and illegal parking. The second point supports the police take home pay. Why should we care? We compete with our uh, for police recruits with other occupations and surrounding cities, towns, and districts. We are not competitive. If we are not competitive, we will get a lower quality of recruits. 20% is a huge difference in pay. The town can't afford to make up the difference out of our general fund. 20% of our pay of uniformed officers equals about $1.1 million. Which budget shall we take that from? Today, that comes from the private utilities. In addition, the town makes about 10% on administrative costs. And finally, it provides value of service to the community. The state uh, prevailing wage law requires that contractors hired by the town be paid a set amount, which is approximately 90% of a police officer's detail pay. If you don't like the prevailing wage law, uh, take that to your state rep or senator, but that's the law now. So what is done for the extra 10% or $5 an hour? We get trained law enforcement officers, very visible on the street, deterring crime, whether robbery or speeding or illegal parking. Two, we have additional public safety personnel if there's an accident or a major disaster. And three, we have a medically trained first responder on the streets. When you, get a when you make a 911 call for a medical emergency, most people don't know this, but the chances are the first town personnel to respond will be a police officer because they're already in your neighborhood, trained as medical first responders and CPR. Thus, for an extra $5 an hour, the taxpayer doesn't even pay for it. The citizens get additional crime deterrent in the area additional personnel in emergency for emergency or accidents, and medical first responders, again, in the area. To vote no on this article does not replace police officers with flaggers. It does not save the town any money. It only means some detail work will go to out-of-town officers instead of retired Arlington officers. It only punishes our retired officers who put their lives on the line to keep our community safe over many years. That makes no sense and is grossly unfair. Please vote yes on the selectman's motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. I'm gonna call Mr. Timo Yontar to make a correction from his statement the other day. Mr. Yontar. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Timo Kai Yontar, Precinct 7. I want to offer a correction and an apology to town meeting. I made a mistake in my remarks on this article last session because when I closed, I said approximately, if the town were to save money on details by using flagmen, it could use the savings to increase police salaries. Now, this is incorrect and oversimplifying for two reasons. First, a large portion of the details are paid by third parties, such as utilities. So a switch there would not save the town budget any money. Uh, secondly, the details that are paid by the town are paid from the capital budget. So savings there could not flow over to the operating budget, which pays police salaries. Uh, savings there would be just more money that could be spent on capital projects. So while I do think it's that the town should uh, explore spending its money on flagmen rather than on police details, because they are legal, effective, and cheaper, it's incorrect to suggest that the savings could be used to pay the police more. Paying the police more is a separate matter entirely. I did not intend to mislead town meeting. And I apologize for my error. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Yontar. We appreciate that. Mr. Edward Trimbley. Good evening. Um, 
like many of you, I have wondered name, why. Name, Mr. Tremblay, name and precinct oh, number. Edward Tremblay, precinct 19. Thank you. Uh, like many of you, I have wondered why we needed police officers on detail while the rest of the world seems to use flagmen. Then I got a job that required me to work in the streets sometimes. And I came to really appreciate police officers on details. A good detail officer facilitates the efficiency of a job site. They direct traffic and pedestrians, move cones. They facilitate the movement of construction vehicles. They can close roads, set up detours, and if, if need be. And they also have an authority that flagmen don't have. I was working in the uh, Starrow Drive on-ramp right at BU one night, and a driver followed by six others decided to drive around the barricades right into the oncoming off-ramp lane off of Starrow Drive. The, uh, the officer on detail put a stop to it right then. And while he was fair, he didn't hand out anybody tickets. He did let them know in no uncertain terms that there wasn't okay and that they were endangering the lives of a number of people, including myself. No flag man could have done that. I also got to see a detail officer because of their radios become aware of a nearby bank robbery. And he knew it immediately what to look for and to keep his eyes open for. I mean, we didn't see anything, but he was, he was watching. Um, we did have problems with details though. Sometimes we couldn't get them. And we'd either have to wait until we could get one or we'd have to work in the street without them, which is not, not the best situation. Sometimes officers from, an, uh, from another town would come and they, and they were fine. They knew, they knew how to direct traffic and all that, but the people stop a lot and ask directions. They ask where things are. And the local cops can do that. The, the uh, cops from out of town really don't know the answers to that. So the bottom line for me is that a, you know, detail costs, a detail officer costs a little extra money, but the benefits of a good detail officer is worth, worth a lot more than the $40 a day that uh, Flagman would, say, uh, would save. And having a re uh, retired police officer available just means that anybody needing a detail can get one. You know, at the end of the day, a good detail officer vastly improves the chances we can all come home. And uh, so I, I'd ask you to vote yes on this common sense solution to a safety issue for those of us who have to work in the street. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Tremblay. Mr. Ciano has a point of order. Mr. Ciano, what's your point of order? Uh, one, uh, one of the speakers that you were Identify about, yourself first, oh, Frank. forgive me. Frank Ciano, Precinct 15. A prior speaker was allowed to speak for a second time solely for the purpose of making correction, and then he made an argument. And that's not correct. That's not right. Okay. I hear your, hear your uh, point of order, and... I thought it was important for him to make his corrections because he was speaking on behalf of the Capital Planning Committee when he spoke. We don't want to have a mis miscommunication from one of our committees. So I think, I believe that his entire uh, point was correcting his other issue, but I do hear what you're saying. And generally people are not allowed to speak a second time till the speaking list has been cleared of all other speakers, but I did make an exception for that one point by Mr. Uh, Yontar. So uh, I thank you for your point of order, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Liba Haim. Liba Haim, Precinct 11. I move the question. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate by Ms. Hyam. Second. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. It's been seconded by Mr. Foskett. The motion to terminate debate is not debatable. So we're going to enable voting. And precincts one through seven, please navigate over to the uh, portal page, refresh screen if necessary, precincts eight through 15, go ahead and do that now. 
and 16 through 21, go ahead and navigate over to the portal. Refresh if you need to. Press one for yes to terminate debate, two for no if you want to continue debating, and then pick cast your vote. If you're having an issue to voting, please use the raised hand feature in Zoom and get my and Ms. Um, Sullivan's attention. And we'll find out what your issue is. If you're phoning in your vote, you'll want to call Miss Brazil at 781-316-3071. At 781-316-3071. And 239 of our town meeting members have voted so far. Out of the 242 that are here, so we have about three, well, oh, there were some tensions last time. Okay, so we have an even higher number. So we have five, 240 out of the 245 have voted. Jane Morgan, Janice Weber, Len Carden, Peter Howard, and Adele Cordell has voted. And if those last four people can go ahead and vote at this point in time, we're gonna give them 15 seconds. Jane Morgan, Janice Weaver. You have about five seconds left to give your vote. And time's up. Let's close voting. Ah, the motion failed. They want to continue to debate. It's not a two-thirds vote. 90-90, okay. So we're going to continue debating. Let's go back to the uh, speaker list. As soon as we get through that, oh, 43. Okay, 243 in the affirmative, 90 in the negative. 61% and we needed 66% to prevail on that vote. We did not get it. So we're back to the list. As soon as we go through the screens. Maybe what we'll do is before we go back to the screen, to we'll go back to the um, speaker list, but then before we start taking additional speakers, we'll take our five minute break because it's 9.30. Okay, so let's take our five minute break at this point and we come back, we'll go back to the list. And Mr. Warden will be our first speaker when we get back, okay. Okay, town meeting members, please come in and take your seats. That's what I usually say, bang my gavel. Don't even have that. That's in town hall, in my little cubicle. Okay, let's get going. Um, let's promote Mr. Warden up. Mr. Warden, you're the next speaker. Um, your life your has uh, unmuted me. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, I'm looking at the long list of uh, speakers here, and I, I'm urging uh, my fellow town meeting members to have respect for, for those who wish to speak. Uh, 
it's uh, this is an important issue. There's obviously a lot of uh, thought and emotion on both sides of it. Different aspects were brought out, and uh, you know we, we are elected by our constituents in the precincts to come and debate this stuff and listen to every view and make a reasoned decision. We can't do that if somebody just chops off uh, debate at, at an early point. And you, you took that stuff just before the, the break uh, and, and rejected, rejected it, which I wish we do that more often. Uh, in my long, my 50 years in town meeting, I don't, I've never voted that I can recall to terminate debate because I think we should hear all issues, all, all viewpoints, even those with which we don't agree. We should listen. That's what they did in the old days. Uh, so, and I think it's particularly inappropriate for this member of the Board of Selectmen to move to terminate debate because they're the ones that decided to have this meeting, which was not necessary. They, 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 they held Mr. the warrant. Mr. Warden, uh, you're outside the scope of the article, John. Okay. Well, then I, 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 will, I, will, I, have, I have reasons for saying that, but I won't. All right. I know. Uh, and... Um, and in any event, I, I, I urge you to, to, to let the debate go on and let, let, every, let every voice be heard on, on this important issue for our town. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Beth Ann Friedman. Nathan Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, I'm, hello. Hi, go ahead. Um, Mr. Moderator, I rise in favor of, of this article. Um, I prefer that um, members of the town of Arlington fulfill this function as, as a survey on special details versus the town having to go outside of Arlington to find appropriate personnel. And though um, I also see the um, advantage of using flaggers, I think that's outside the scope of this um, article. There were no um, amendments suggesting the use of flaggers. And this article deals only with um, whether the uh, police chief and the, and the Town manager be able to hire retired police officers to serve this function. So again, I'm in favor of this article, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, Ms. Friedman. Larry Lawrence Slotnick. I'm Mr. Moderator. I. Uh... I'm not raising my hand to speak to this article. I, um, I separately, I was just hoping to submit a report to town meeting tonight, but we can handle that at another time. Yeah, yeah, I didn't get a chance to reopen um, article one to take your report in at that point. So we can do it the first thing Wednesday evening. Okay. Great, sorry about that. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hyam has a point of order. Leba Hyam, Precinct 11. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I just want to bring up that as entitled, every town meeting member is to share their opinions about any article. So are town meeting members entitled to decide when they feel that they have heard balanced arguments on both sides of an issue and are able to raise um, a, a move towards voting. I implore you to please safeguard those rights as well. Thank yes. you. Yes, um, that's true. Everyone has the right to terminate debate when they think they've had enough, as you did last time around. And thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> that'll bring up Guillermo Hamlin. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi. So Name and precinct? My, Guillermo Hamlin, Precinct 14, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Okay. So I maintain that this is a common sense solution to a need by police officers. However, things that appear common sense sometimes make me suspicious. 
So I want to ask, in regards to um, traffic enforcement, I believe that when it comes to flaggers, say for instance, there is a ICE officer that wants to go ahead and partake in some sort of law enforcement traffic checkpoint, I feel that a police officer may be able to rebuff an ICE agent. However, I have a question for the, I don't know if it's appropriate to the select board, the- um, Well, you ask the question and I get to decide. Yes. Okay, so I wanna know, is, is this in any way, shape or form, do these officers participate with ICE? to participate in law enforcement and traffic checkpoints. Uh, Chief Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. No, the Allington Police Department does not cooperate with ICE. Does that mean when it comes to traffic checkpoints, they won't participate in measures such as a clean sweep or removing uh, a resident from their vehicle uh, on the basis of the condition of their uh, status. Chief? That is correct. Okay, thank you so much. I'm satisfied. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Barron? Pass. Thank you. Uh, Michael Ruderman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I'd like to ask, uh, does any, Mr. Moderator, can you call on anyone who has hard numbers for the number of times that officers working details have actually been involved in incidents where they were an actual force multiplier? Chief Flaherty, do you have an answer for Mr. Ruderman on that point? Chief Julie Flaherty, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I don't have hard numbers um, that you're asking for. I can cite examples when police officers um, were working details and they responded to um, bank robberies in progress. Um, they responded to medical calls where they actually um, performed CPR and um, took life-saving measures. And um, I listen to the radio daily and I often hear officers who are on detail um, call off to a location where um, office, uh, where patrol officers are responding to. Um, so they are in close proximity and able to attend to the emergency quicker than um, the officer responding. So although I don't have hard numbers, um, I, can, I can tell you there have been many times where detail officers have responded to emergency calls and intervened. Thank you for posing the question, Mr. Moderator. I'll take that as a no. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, Chief, or to any other member. The question was, does anyone have hard data on this? It was offered as a, an advantage uh, for continuing to pay, pay whatever extra incremental cost uh, there is in engaging uh, members of the sworn force as, as um, uh, you know, it working working details within roads, and I have every bit of simply sympathy for Mr. Trombley. That must be a scary as hell situation to see drivers coming at you. I would want, I would want armored vehicles out there protecting me. Again, though, these are anecdotes, and I urge my fellow town meeting members to listen past the anecdotes. Ask for the hard data. I will be voting no on this. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. In all due respect. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. But that is the kind of question I would have preferred to have received prior to tonight's meeting so that I could have Chief Flaherty actually get us numbers. Um, but next time, um, if you would let me know those kind of things in advance so I can get you a good answer. Thank you, Mr. Ruderman. I understand, sir. Yes. Um, Charles Foskett. Moderator, uh, Charles Foskett, Precinct 8. <clears throat> I have a question for the uh, town manager. Yes, sir. Um, if, in uh, voting uh, against this article, we, uh, I'm sorry, this article will not give, if you vote against this article, we will not have uh, town civilian flag persons, as I understand it. Uh, I believe that this would have to be an issue that would be separately addressed. Am I correct there? I believe you're correct, sir. Uh, Mr. Chaplain, is he correct? Adam Chaplain, town manager, yes, that, that is correct. 
Thank you. Uh, I have a, another question, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we have uh, heard that it's approximately a 19% difference in the salary uh, between uh, putative uh, civilian flaggers and, uh, the, and the wages paid to uh, police officers. Um, does, if, if, the, uh, if the wage, I'm sorry, if the civilian flaggers should be used to replace the police uh, services here, would this become a uh, change in working conditions for the average police officer who relies on paid details uh, for income? And would this become an issue in collective bargaining? Can someone answer that question for me? Mr. Chapdelaine? Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Yes, I would say Mr. Foskett just described the situation correctly. So, um, so as a follow on, would that mean that uh, the town would likely have to pay the difference in uh, increased police uh, salaries and benefits in addition to paying the cost of the civilian flaggers so that effectively there would be no cost savings in such a change? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, obviously, you know, bargaining is something unto itself and predicting outcomes can be challenging, but in broad strokes, a situation where we would be heavily levered both locally and potentially at third party arbitration to increase the salary, the base salary of officers if they had this compensation taken away from them uh, would be likely and I think I think the, the context you described, whereby we would both be paying more out of general fund dollars to a high, increased base salary, while also employing either through direct employment or contracting an additional flagger service, uh, could eliminate any savings or even uh, produce increased cost. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaplain. So I, I would just like to uh, comment that for all the reasons uh, so eloquently described by Mr. Tosti and Mr. Trembley, that um, I ask my fellow town meeting members to please uh, vote in favor of Article 15. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Barbara Thornton. Yes. Thank you. My name is Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16. And I realize that this is the first, uh, uh, roughly the first year for Chief Flaherty to be in office. We haven't heard much about her, but I'd like to give her an opportunity to run her department the way she thinks best to make the new changes and, and respect her for that opportunity. And I'd like to give her an opportunity now if she would take it to maybe say a few words about why this is an important issue for her, or what data she's looked at that she considers compelling for making, uh, for supporting this request. Uh, I'm gonna entertain that, but I'm gonna round the conversation back for the last several speakers and future speakers. We are talking about an act relative to appointment of retired police officers as special police officers in the town, i.e. road details only, retired police officers. A lot of this conversation has devolved into uh, civilian flaggers, regular police, regular police conversation. So Chief, if you can talk about why retired police officers as uh, detail workers would be good for you as Ms. Thornton asks, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police, um, and thank you for making that clarification. Um, this vote, does, uh, this article um, would not have any effect on police details by active police officers. This article is about whether or not retired officers would be permitted to work details. Um, it doesn't have any bearing on replacing active police officers um, with flaggers. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Thornton, for your question. I think having retired officers working details is a good thing for the town. Um, I, I stated last week we have an average of 20 police uh, 20 details a day. Um, we, we probably fill 75% of those details. Um, and we, we um, are calling on other communities to assist us. Um, that was a satisfactory solution up until a few years ago when surrounding cities and towns um, started using their own officers for their own projects. Um, but by having retired police officers work details, we're putting trained members of the Arlington Police Department in the community 
who are familiar with the community. Um, they have a direct connection. These offices have years, years of experience. They're academy trained, and they have participated in the trainings that are specific to the Arlington Police Department. Um, as I stated um, to, and to the last speaker, there have been many times when detail officers um, on assignment have um, located missing persons, missing children. Um, the, if a bank alarm is broadcasted over the police radio, a retired Arlington officer is much more likely to know where that location um, of the bank is and potentially intervene as opposed to um, an outside um, police detail. And the same holds true for medical calls, um, traffic crashes, and any other type of emergency situation. Um, there also have been many instances in the recent past where we've had to tell contractors um, and utility workers that they cannot work on a particular street um, on a particular day because we just don't have the offices to assist with um, traffic. And this is all often frustrating um, for our utility companies. Um, recently, some of you may have noticed that um, Verizon was in Arlington Center and they were um, working on a project that lasted several weeks. Um, many times because we had officers at the other um, end of the center assisting with pedestrian and traffic safety with town projects, we've had to tell Verizon that we weren't able to fill um, the detail and, and they would have to schedule it another time. Well, they went ahead and brought in the state police um, without consulting with us to work these detail, to details on Mass Ave at Mill Street. Um, so I think it's a good thing for the town and, um, and, I, and I support this article. Um, and that's all I have to say about it right now. Thank you, Chief. Ms. Thornton. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. And I think she feels strongly about it and I wanna respect her for that. And I will be voting in favor of it. Thank you very much. Uh, Roderick Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roderick Holland, Precinct 7. Um, I support this uh, article. I find uh, Chief Flaherty's um, uh, presentation about uh, uh, the uh, detail officers as a force multiplier to be compelling. Uh, Arlington is not over-policed. Arlington um, police officers are not overpaid. Uh, this is helpful in against both of those things, and I will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Laurie Leahy. Lori Leahy, Precinct 21. Um, I just had a couple of questions for clarifications. I, I'm not sure if I've missed things, but I feel like I don't have a handle on the numbers at all. So my first question is, um, what portion of the details are paid for by the town versus third parties? Um, the number of 20 details a day has been suggested, and I'm just wondering, of that 20, how many are private versus town paid? Uh, Chief Flaherty? That number would vary um, daily with the different projects that are happening in town. Can you give me a sense of uh, throughout the year? I mean, is it 50% or 20% or third parties? I have, I have no idea. Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Um, in any given day, we have tw uh, up to 20 or more details. And if I had to um, estimate, I would say um, that 75% um, of those details are um, outside utility companies or contractors. But again, I don't have those hard numbers in front of me. So that's just, um, that's an estimate. Hmm. I guess because this is um, a lot about savings or, well, it's a lot about a lot of different issues, but one of the issues is definitely about savings. I'm just kind of surprised that the numbers haven't been presented to us. It seems like that would really help a lot of people decide on this issue. Um, 
So my next question is that, um, is it true that retired police officers would be able to apply as civilians for these positions? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chaplain? I, Ms. Adam Chaplain, town manager, I'm not, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Um, if this is not passed and we start using civilian flaggers, anyone can apply for that, like a retired police officer could apply for that position. Is that true? Uh, Mr. Heim is going to answer. Doug Heim? So, oh. Well, I, if, I, if, I, if I could, Mr. Moderator, Adam Chaplin, sure. Town Manager, I, 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 think, I think we've, we've tried um, to make clear that this, this article does not address civilian flaggers. Uh, okay. Whether or not this article rises or falls will not impact, uh, th this action tonight will not impact whether or not the town will use civilian flaggers. I think Mr. Pooler wants to um, throw a little bit more onto that, Mr. Chapterlin. That's okay with me. Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sandy Pooler, uh, Deputy Town Manager. Um, I was able to take a look at the money that we paid out to officers in uh, the year uh, 2000. 16% uh, of what we paid uh, was or on town details um, and the 84% were for other details. And among those town details, I would just say um, a, a certain percentage, and I can't tell you what that percentage is. I, I don't know, it's not in the records. Are, are for things in addition to road projects. There are things like parades or town day or so forth. So uh, to ask, uh, to answer Ms. Leahy's question about what the percentages are that are paid by outside contractors versus the town, those are the percentages. Okay, um, thank you. I think those are my only two questions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Leahy. Um, Kevin Koch. Koch. Mm -hmm. Mr. Koch, you can unmute yourself. Mr. Moderator, I see um, Kevin in Zoom twice. So ah. I, um, I'll try his other. Yes, it was the other one. Yes, I see that. Second one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. Thank My you, Emily. My question is about section two of this article listing these various laws, section parts of the uh, state laws that these, um, uh, officers would be either uh, subject to or not subject to. And I don't have a clue what those are. Can somebody give me a summary of what, what those various chapters and sections? Yes, Mr. Heim, Mr. Heim can do that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, discussed this, uh, I believe, last week's town meeting, but uh, it's an important question. The, uh, each, each thing refers to something a little different. So chapter 31 of the general laws relates to civil service. And the officers, if uh, they were appointed, would not be subject to protections under the civil service law. Uh, sections 85H and 85H and a half have to do with disability retirement for police and fire um, and general disability retirement. Obviously these folks are already retired. Um, sections uh, 99A, 100, or 111F, have to do with um, indemnification, line of duty, which is basically leave with pay. Those things don't apply to special um, officers. And chapter 41 of the general, I'm sorry, chapter 150E, that's basically your standard labor provision for collectively bargained employees. So they're not covered by collectively bargained contracts. The reason that's important is because as has been highlighted a couple of times, these are not um, these folks are no longer collectively bargained employees. They're appointed and serve at the will of um, the town manager and can be dismissed without 
all of the basic labor protections that we would see under civil service or collective bargaining. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anything else, Mr. Koch? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Gast. Peter Gast, Precinct 2. Um, my understanding from last town meeting was that it was possible to use civilian flaggers for some details um, on certain velocity of roads and certain situations. Um, as I understood earlier this evening, that's not possible. Um, and so I was hoping that um, someone could clarify under what circumstances we could use civilian flaggers. Um, the reason this is relevant to this question is because I want to understand uh, what the need for additional resources to, to be flagmen are and how critical the need is and, and why we're not using civilian flaggers currently if the need is, is critical. Uh, Mr. Hahn. Doug Hahn, Town Council, and Mr. Moderator. Um, the base, uh, the first thing to sort of understand is there's two basic different types of detail. The law authorizes one kind of detail to be serviced by civilian flaggers. So the chief just mentioned, or maybe it was Mr. Fuller who mentioned, that there are certain types of details that basically involve more than um, the traffic direction that civilian flaggers are required to be trained to provide under the law. Uh, things like parades, events at a park, things where the concern isn't just traffic, there might be uh, other pedestrian safety concerns, there might be a need to have um, police on hand for, uh, to provide first responders, things of that nature. There's like a fun run throughout Arlington. Usually there's some sort of detail uh, that's uh, subject uh, one of the conditions of approval. The second piece is obviously what the crux of this conversation is going to doubt, it's about construction projects. Um, roadway construction projects that are on roads that are under 45 miles an hour are eligible for civilian flaggers. There's a few other sort of nuances to the situation, but the long and short of it is, is that it depends a little bit on the roadway and how it's set up so that it can be safely secured. Um, so civilian flaggers can in some uh, work on, a, on, on certain road projects and they can't work on the sort of other type of uh, use of detail officers which is events, uh, parades, things like that. hope that answers your question. Almost. So why are we not utilizing the existing possibility of civilian flaggers for those projects where they could be used under 45 miles an hour construction projects in order to free up additional capacity so that there isn't um, officers uh, not able to fill the, the rest of the capacity. If, if there is a, an urgent need to expand the pool, why are we not already using this resource? Uh, I don't think that question. Yeah, yeah, I'll I, ask Mr. Chapdelaine to address that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I mean, to, to be direct on this, former Governor Patrick put forward reforms over a decade ago to try to further enable or really allow civilian flaggers to be more widely used in Massachusetts. And at that time, the, le the legislature gutted that reform and put in place some reforms that still made it very hard for local governments to utilize civilian flaggers the requirement to pay, pay prevailing wage, maintaining it as a mandatory subject of collective bargaining for a change in working conditions for police officers, made it very hard to pursue civilian flaggers. And that's why, as was referenced on the first night of this debate, only 27 of the 351 towns, cities and towns in Massachusetts currently use civilian flaggers. So less than 10% of cities and towns use civilian flaggers. We've chosen to not prioritize this matter as something we would pursue in collective bargaining for, for myriad reasons. There, there's many items, uh, both related and unrelated to police reform, that we would much rather pursue at the collective bargaining table as opposed to opening the door to civilian flaggers. We've really looked at this article 
in, with a very narrow scope. We have trained police officers who have expressed an interest in being able to work these details. It's a common practice in Massachusetts, 11 out of our 12 comparable communities and most of our neighboring communities allow this practice. It was a very straightforward, narrow focused approach to be able to provide just, just a few more Arlington trained officers to work details. So I, I, I suppose that that's the best way I can answer that question, Mr. Guest. Uh, th thank you very much for that answer. Um, You're welcome. I, a subject I haven't heard spoken of this night, um, and it, it's a concern of mine. This is one of the most um, voluminous warrant articles I've seen in my in my tenure so far, and it seems like it encodes very fine details of the issue into law, which will require articles before town meeting if we want to update any of those details in the future. Um, why is this article so specific? Mr. Moderator Mayor? Yes, Mr. Heim, please. Doug Heim, Town Council. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, thank you, Mr. Jeff. It's a good question. Um, it speaks a little bit more to a very, very broad uh, uh, a sense of things about what the powers and authorities of town meeting are and how we go about best availing ourselves of those uh, authorities. So when we submit a request for special legislation, um, that vote before you has to be detailed enough that the special legislation will outline everything that we need to accomplish in order to realize whatever that goal is. Um, sometimes we ask for a specific type of special legislation because that, that's a little bit uh, less heavy in detail because we want to be given a broad authority. So, with, uh, for example, with respect to our prohibition on new um, fossil fuel infrastructure, we wanted to grant ourselves broad authorities so that we could have some time to hone in on a very specific bylaw. This uh, specific warrant article and the motion before you is a essentially model legislation that's used in a lot of the communities that the manager referenced. So a lot of the sort of work was already put into it. And then secondly, some Arlington specific detail was added into it so that we would know exactly, and I believe this was some of the input that we got, that we would know exactly, you know, who the town manager and the police chief could appoint to this position what the restrictions were, what things they were um, going to be uh, uh, not entitled to. Um, it was important that all that detail be in the leg legislation so that we knew exactly what, uh, we're in, wh wh what our position is relative to the authority to do this. So again, it, it basically distills down to what authority are we asking the legislature to confer on us? And sometimes, when we're asking for the legislature to confer on us a very, very specific thing, the irony is that you're, you get a more detailed piece of special legislation in front of town meeting and therefore in front of the legislature. Uh, when we're sometimes asking for something very, very broad, we don't know every single piece of it when we're submitting it to, um, to the legislature and we're asking for either a town bylaw or something else to regulate these things. There's a lot more detail I could go into, but I-, I, I No, well, I, I think that's good, and I, I think Mr. Gast has used all his time up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Gast. Ms. Dre has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 8. I, I'm sorry if this is I'm learning. Is, I have more of a point of information to ask for clarification about what Deputy Town Manager um, Sandy Cooler said. I don't know if this is appropriate or not, so you can shut me down. <laughs> yeah, that would be a that'd be a question when you get up for your second time after everyone else has had a chance. Thank you very much, Mr. Matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Mark McCabe. I stand to terminate debate on Article 15 and all matters before it. And this is Mr. Mark McCabe of Precinct 2. Second. 
Okay, Mr. McCabe has made a motion to terminate the debate. Mr. Foskett has seconded it. Uh, Mr. Kowalski will bring up the motion to terminate debate. Terminating debate is not debatable. And we bring up the screens, you'll see the voting grid. Okay, precincts one through eight, go ahead and navigate over to the uh, voting portal. Refresh if you need to. Uh, one for yes, two for no, precincts eight through 16, go ahead and vote, navigate over. We're terminating debate on article 15, and now precincts uh, 16 through 21, go ahead and uh, navigate over. For one yes to terminate debate, two for no to terminate debate on this article. Um, and once debate, once you voted either yes or no, then hit cast your vote. If you have an issue voting, please use the uh, raised hand feature in Zoom. We have about eight members who have not voted. Oh, we're down to three members who have not voted yet. If those last three can vote, Ms. Zimmer, Mr. Gersh, down to two. And I'll give them 15 seconds. Mr. Gersh, Mr. Zimmer, Angela Ozulski, Jane Howe, and five seconds, and time. Okay. It's our second motion to terminate debate. It passes by 78%. We have 185 in the affirmative and 53 in the negative, that is a vote to terminate, and I so declare it. When we finish going through the screens, we're going to make a vote on the main motion. Article 15, recommended vote in the select board support. Okay, we're gonna bring up the recommended vote of the select board report to go ahead and vote on act relative to the appointment of retired police officers as special police officers in the town for detail work. So precincts one through 15, or excuse me, one through eight, navigate over, and precincts eight through 16, then 16 through 21, Navigate over, refresh if you need to. Vote one for yes to authorize this special legislation. Act two, excuse me, press two for no if you do not want to authorize retired police officers and then hit cast your vote. If you're having an issue voting, please use the raised hand screen or call Miss Brazil's number 781-316-3071. And I'm gonna give it a minute for everybody to one for yes, two for no, and then cast your vote.
I know 10 folks who haven't voted yet. If you can go ahead and vote at this point. We got seven people, six people left. Mr. El Nui, Mr. Hamlin, Ms. Dutra, Ms. Krause, Peter Thompson, and Ms. Rowe. A few folks can go ahead and vote. Okay, let me give them 15 seconds for the last three people. Five seconds for the last few voters. And we're closing the bit vote. Let's close the vote, Mr. Korowski. The motion carries by 67%. We have 158 in the affirmative. We have 78 in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it. And that closes Article 15. As soon as we run through the screens, we'll close 15 and bring up Article 16. Article 16 is recommended vote of the uh, redevelopment board of no action. And as we have no substitute motions, we're gonna go right to a vote. So all in favor of no action, please vote one for yes, two for no. So as soon as Adam hits confirm, Okay, so precincts, you guys know the drill. One through eight, go over to the voting platform. Eight through 16, go on over the voting platform. And 21 through, excuse me, 16 through 21, go on over. One, to turn, one for no action. Two, I don't know what no would be. Yeah, you know, I have a choice for to vote no action. And then hit cast your vote. If you have any issue voting, please use the raised hand feature on Zoom. So if the town meeting members can please cast your vote at this point in time. One for yes, two for no. And town people left to vote. We're gonna give them 15 seconds. Looks like all verbal votes have been entered. We have five more seconds to vote if you have not voted yet. And that's it, let's close voting. So, we have 
228 in the affirmative. We have seven no's, and the vote carries by 97%. That's a vote for no action, and I so declare it, and that closes Article 16. I'm going to go through the screens. It's going to bring up Article 17. And Ms. Sullivan, why don't we get Mr. Rod Mr. Rudiman up? And Ms. Milofchek has a point of order. Ms. Sullivan, can we bring her up? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I apologize. Oh, um, name and precinct? Beth Milofchek, Precinct 9. I, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I apologize. I'm just very confused um, whether Article 15 had to be a two-thirds vote and when you said the numbers, I, I, I just couldn't follow it. So oh, I apologize. 15 is a majority vote. It was a majority vote. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Okay. We're now on Article 17. Mr. Uh, Ruderman, you have a something to tell us. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I offer a substitute motion, which has been distributed to all the members and uh, is in rather simple form. It looks quite like... Uh, the article as originally submitted. However, it states the matter in the affirmative so that the meeting has something uh, upon which to uh, consider and debate as, as the recommended vote is one of no action. I offer the substitute motion and I hope people will support it with a positive vote. Okay, do you wanna say anything about it yes. or just that's it? Sure, I'll begin. Um, Back in 2016, this meeting uh, formed a committee called the Residential Study Group to look at questions of the disruptive nature of uh, residential demolitions, excavations, other, other examples of, of uh, very large, you know, gross, uh, you know, construction activities in neighborhoods and to see if there would see if there was something that could be done to allay uh, homeowners anxieties about these projects. They went out and they talked to people and they found out that many of these concerns could be very simply answered if the folks in the neighborhood knew who they needed to call to find out the answers to simple commonplace questions like when is this project going to start and end? What are the allowable hours of operation? How long are you going to be detonating the ledge in the backyard? Where are the construction vehicles going to permit? Are you doing things about the dust? You know, very, very human immediate concerns like that. They came back to the town meeting in 2017 with a, a short set of, of um, amendments to, to um, uh, the bylaw, the town bylaw, which have been dubbed the good, the good Neighbor Agreement. Essentially, they require someone asking for a building permit for one of these large projects, a whole house demolition or reconstruction, excavation, removal of a certain number of trees in a protected area, to present that plan to the neighbors, to give them a contact person, let them know when things are going to begin and end, basically give them a way to get questions answered. And this needs to be done before you can get your building permit approved. What I'm asking the meeting to do tonight is to put a cross-reference into the zoning bylaw. And I take particular attention to pronounce zoning bylaw versus town bylaw. I ask you to put a cross-reference to this set of provisions in the town bylaw, a cross-reference to it in the zoning bylaw so that anyone who consults the zoning bylaw on the requirements for get, getting a building permit will see right at the very top of section 3.1.B where, where the power of the, of, of the building inspector to grant a permit is detailed, that the permit shall be issued when the building inspector finds that the applicant is in compliance with the applicable provisions 
of this good neighbor agreement, formally Title VI, Article Seven of the town bylaws. Again, I say it creates a cross-reference between the town bylaw, where this set of provisions exists, and the zoning bylaw, where many people would think that is the one place where you would go to see what you would need to do to get a building permit. And that would be incorrect. I am hoping to, to avoid anyone not knowing of the existence of the Good Neighbor Agreement by creating a flag, if you would call it. I, I, I count, is it 28 words? A flag, a cross-reference in the zoning bylaw to a provision in the town bylaws, which references, references you to these requirements. My substitute motion does not expand the scope of the Good Neighbor Agreement. It doesn't make getting a building permit any more onerous. The requirements are exactly the same. I am asking you to create another place where these provisions are noticed. And I emphasize the word notice. That's all I'm trying to do here, create notice of one set of provisions in another document, which people may think is the one and only controlling document for getting a building permit. Back in 2017, when, when these provisions were brought before us, they were, they were heartily uh, accepted. I believe the vote was something like 205 to three. It was one of the most overwhelmingly positive changes uh, to the town bylaws I can remember. Unfortunately, since 2017, the provisions of the so-called good neighbor agreement have oftentimes been forgotten, ignored, missed, simply not noticed, I don't know, but they haven't been carried out. One survey that was conducted by our own town's planning and community development department found a compliance rate of less than 40%. What I'm hoping to do is to provide some way that we can take an action as the town meeting to, to make compliance with the good neighbor agreement easier by making it more noticed. Again, this is not increasing the scope of the Good Neighbor Agreement. It either applies to the project or it doesn't apply to the project. It doesn't make the requirements for a building permit any different. It doesn't, it doesn't make the uh, enforcement any more onerous on inspectional services. It doesn't change the prescribed penalty for, for violation of the Good Neighbor Agreement. That was set back in 2017. It's as much as $200 a day for violation. I can't tell you specifically how many times the Good Neighbor Agreement has been missed or ignored or violated because we don't keep a record of that. I can tell you that I asked for an official listing of how many times the $200 per day uh, penalty for violation has ever been assessed. The answer is zero, none. It has never been assessed in the three years that the Good Neighbor Agreement has existed. I am asking the meeting to take one small step towards making the Good Neighbor Agreement better known by creating a cross-reference in a place where people commonly look to see what the requirements for a building permit are. That's all, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Foskett. Can you second? Second. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mo Mr. Uh, Ruhrman has made a substitute motion. It's been seconded, therefore it's now up for debate. Mr. Schleckman. Thank you, Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9. Mr. Ruderman's substitute motion is unnecessary in theory, but probably necessary in practice, can't hurt, could help. Please vote yes. Thank you, sir. Christopher Hyam. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Topher Hyam, Precinct 11. Um, Mr. Moderator, I'm wondering if anyone from the Redevelopment Board can explain their recommendation of no action. Uh, Ms. Ray? Jennifer Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. I'm going to actually defer to Rachel Zembury, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, who is also with us this evening. Oh, very good. Yes, Ms. Ms. Zembury. Thank 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. There were actually uh, two reasons why the Redevelopment Board uh, voted no action on this particular article. The first was due to the, the circular reference and the fact that in the zoning bylaws, the, uh, the definition of the, the types of um, the types of, of renovations and other construction activities are actually broader than what is defined in the town bylaws. Uh, so given that it was more expansive, um, the recommendation at the time was for the uh, applicant to uh, review, actually come back in a, at a future meeting and look at actually revising the language of the town bylaw as opposed to the zoning bylaw if the goal was to, um, to increase enforcement of this particular uh, good neighbor agreement. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, very good. Um, Ms. Maglia Magliazzo. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sophie Meliata, Precinct 8. Um, I rise to read a statement from a resident who would like to address town meeting. Very well. Thank you. So the statement is provided by Mr. Don Seltzer of Irving Street, a resident of Clinton for 48 years. He says, I would like to speak in support of Article 17, which is meant to improve compliance with the Good Neighbor Agreement. It was passed by town meeting in 2017, but essentially ignored by the town department responsible for overseeing it. This is a case of deja vu. Another 2017 accomplishment of the residential study group was a bylaw limited residential driveway slope to a 15% slope for safety reasons. Town meeting passed it overwhelmingly 200 to 13. Yet in the following year, builders continued to build driveways with steeper slopes. Inspectional services continued to approve them, apparently because of an ambiguity in defining how slope was measured. In 2019, several members of the residential study group drafted a warrant article meant to correct this ambiguity, but the redevelopment board voted no action for reasons that were not terribly clear. Here is their report to town meeting. I quote, the ARB required additional clarification to further understand the intent and outcome of this article. However, the limited scope of the warrant article did not allow for that further clarification to be addressed in a proposed amendment or the vote. The board is committed to addressing the intent and outcome of this article at a future town meeting, end quote. The bylaw on steep driveways remains unenforced and the board has forgotten all about its commitment to address the issue. With Article 17 this year, it is much the same situation. It was demonstrated to the Redevelopment Board last year that this bylaw was not being enforced. They failed to take any action, and now that a citizen's petition article is being offered, they oppose it for similarly vague reasons, suggesting that it is unnecessary and redundant. They fear it is too burdensome. Back in 2017, the Select Board did not find the Good Neighbor Agreement to be burdensome reporting, I quote, the board, grateful for the time, energy, and teamwork of the residential study group, highly recommends town meeting's approval of this amendment, end quote. Town meeting members agreed voting 205 to 3 to approve. It is now up to this town meeting to make it enforceable. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Magliazzo. And thank you, Mr. Um, Seltzer. Oh, goodness. Seltzer. <laughs> Uh, Steve Revelak, Stephen Revelak. To hello, Miss Hello, Mr. Moderator. This is Steve Revelak from Precinct One. Hello, so I, under I understand that Mr. Rudiman's article proposes to add a cross reference from the zoning bylaw to Title Six, Article Seven of the Town Bylaws, without adding or changing any new requirements. And indeed, paragraph D of Title VI, Article Seven, requires that the, a person doing you know, a, a project subject to the Good Neighbor Agreement satisfy the requirements of the Good, neighborhood, good Neighbor Agreement before a building permit is being issued. So the requirement being proposed by the substitute motion already exists in the town bylaws. 
Now, I do have a few questions, and these I think would be best answered by someone from Inspectional Services if they're available. Well, go ahead and ask your question. We'll figure out who, who's going to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I understand that Inspectional Services has a set of, you know, a process, a set of checklists that they go through before issuing a building permit. I'm wondering if this article were to pass, would there be any change to what Inspectional Services does in, um, you know, when deciding whether or not to issue a building permit? Is Mr. Byrne out there, Mike Byrne? Hi, Michael. Can you answer that question? Oops. So Mr. Byrne, you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself? John, I'm sorry, I thought I did unmute myself. Um, okay. Mike, Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectional Services, Tell me, member precinct 13. Um, the, the checklist, it sounds to me, would be the same. I think um, it, it, it's, 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 it's just, I see it as making it confusing to people trying to figure out how, how to take out permits and what to do where we have, we have, we will have the same law in the, in the town bylaws and the zoning by, and the zoning bylaws. And, you know, I believe they are different, um, you know, fines and, and, and regulations and whatnot um, in, in those. Um, I, I see that, um, I, I would agree with that it's, this, this is already in our bylaws and I don't believe this is necessary. And as far as this being ignored, um, I, 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 we just don't see that. I mean, it, it's pretty simple for us. We don't ignore any of these bylaws. All right, okay. I'm getting off track here. Sorry. Uh, it, uh, but just to confirm, in other words, regardless of whether or not pass, this passes, it will not make a ch any changes to when you do or do not issue a building permit. No, I apologize for that, Steve. Sorry. No, no. Th th thank you very much, Mr. Byrne. Uh, I have another question. Uh, so uh, we've heard about um, some enforcement challenges regarding the Good Neighborhood Agreement. Um, are you, a, what enforcement challenges are you aware of and could you describe the nature of um, how you see these challenges? Um, Steve, I, I would say that um, it actually, I, I took a poll of uh, everyone in the office uh, this week, uh, last week, when I knew this was coming up. And I will tell you that, that we do not know of any ignoring or, or this not being enforced um, you know, it, it, every every time there is something that meets these criteria we know that the good neighbor agreement needs to be there um, you know uh, one confusion sometimes is that it says first class mail uh, we, we suggest and recommend either registered or certified to show evidence that way um, but um, that that is that is probably the only sometimes question we have or that we have no way of checking. Um, but, um, no, um, so in yes. other words, the, in other words, compliance with the good neighbor agreement is on your checklist. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, I was wondering if the, if Mr. Ruderman had any discussion with you about ways in which, um, you know, he felt enforcement might be, you know, improved or asking your feedback on what might make it, you know, might make the process easier. Any conversations like that uh, that took place? Mr. Perron? Uh, the, the, only, the only conversation I've had of this with Mr. Ruderman was on Wednesday afternoon. Um, and he questioned the project at 828 Mass Ave and, uh, the, the, and the question of the Good Neighbor Agreement. Well, that, that project was, and still is, it's an emergency project where the facade was falling off the building um, that already received the special permit. And it's actually, Inspector, Inspector Champa went out there at night and got an engineer out there that was site secured. And, was still, and they, are, they are in the process of going through the demolition uh, uh, permitting, needing sign offs. And part of that would be proof or, or giving us a letter, an affidavit that the good neighbor agreement had been met. So, that, that's the only conversation I've had with Mr. Ruderman on this subject. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
So I, I think that does it for my questions, Mr. Byrne, and I appreciate you taking the time to your, your, you know, your answers to them. Um, I, I, I see what Mr. Ruderman is trying to do, and I respect what he's trying to do, but I would honestly hope that town meeting could take a pass on this. And I'd encourage Mr. Ruderman to work with the building inspector and the folks in inspectional services, uh, find, you know, come to an agreement on how the process might be improved and, um, you know, submit a new article in the spring. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Verplock. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, John Warden. That. You're live, Mr. Warden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, when this article was under discussion um, at the, in the hearings, uh, the Redevelopment Board hearings in, in 2017 um, about uh, whether to recommend it or not, um, I mean, I mean the, 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 good, the good neighbor agreement, um, it is either one of those hearings or at town meeting itself on this, if I were, if we were in a real town meeting, I'd say on this very floor of this hall, uh, Mr. Byrne, uh, when asked, well, if, since this isn't in the zoning bylaw, will it be enforced? And he assured us it absolutely would be enforced. Now, uh, from what we've heard earlier tonight, uh, it's, it's, it's always enforced according to Mr. Byrne, but according to the statistics, which the planning department um, uh, presented, Mr. Ruderman recited, um, the enforcement was something like less than 40%. Uh, and I know that the, uh, originally when this came before the redevelopment board for hearing this year, um, they seemed in favor of it. Uh, the planning director was in favor of it. And then all of a sudden, they discovered all these errors and problems and issues, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the important thing about having it, an important aspect of having it in the zoning bylaw, as opposed or having the reference in the zoning bylaw to essentially bring this language into the, therein, uh, is that any citizen uh, can go to inspectional services and if, if, he, if he or she feels that the law is not being enforced. They can they can demand they can request a written explanation. I think it has to be given within 20 days of why the law is not being enforced. And that is a tool that we do not have right now. So there is, as Mr. Slickman said, we Mr. Slickman and I don't often disagree, uh, and I can't match his elegance of his 10-word speech. But but I, I I encourage you to follow his advice and let's vote yes on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, Patrick Hanlon. Mr. Chairman, Patrick Hanlon of Precinct 5. Um, I have a question. The statistics that are being referred to, I think come in terms of non-enforcement come from a study by the Department of Planning uh, that find, found that 38% of people who responded to a survey say they had not received the appropriate notice. And I was wondering if anybody from the planning department or anyone else uh, who's appropriate, Mr. Moderator, can tell us what the response rate was uh, for that survey. Uh, Ms. Wright, do you have that information for Mr. Hanlon? Jennifer Wright, Director of Planning and Community Development. That's correct. This is from the survey response summary that we conducted in April of 2019. And the information that was provided at that time uh, showed that we had administered a survey to abutters of 24 recent residential construction sites in Arlington and they were mailed to 1,280 households within a 200-foot radius of the 24 sites, and that we received a total of 125 responses to the survey. Uh, of those 125 responses, 48 reported that they received the Good Neighbor Agreement, and 48 said that they had not. The remaining 22% were unsure or did not provide an answer. Hope that helps.
Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Mr. Handlin. Sorry. I wonder go. if, Mr. Moderator, if you could inquire whether um, any effort was made to compare the addresses that were relevant for the people who said they had not received the good neighbor agreement and the others who said that there had to see whether there were particular uh, projects which uh, appear not to have uh, issued the, the notice that was required uh, or, and others uh, that, that had, or whether possibly we're just dealing with uh, inconsistencies of memory here. Ms. Ray? Jennifer Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. We did not do that cross type of analysis that you uh, asked about. So we do not know uh, mm -hmm. that level of detail. I wonder if, if uh, Mr. Moderator, if Ms. Rate would agree that under the circumstances, it goes a little beyond what the evidence would bear to say that that survey shows that less than 40, in less than 40% of the cases, the, um, the rest necessary notice uh, was actually provided. I think, I think we all have to make our own determination of what that survey shows. I, I'm Mr. Moderator, not sure Ms. Rate is going to draw our conclusion of that nature, but Ms. Rate? Jennifer Rate, Director of Planning and Community Development. I would tend to concur with that observation. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Moderator, if I could change course for a moment. I wondered if someone from the uh, Redevelopment Board could give us an example of the ways in which the inconsistencies of language that they are con were concerned with uh, might lead to an expansion of the application of the Good Nature Agreement. Ms. Zemberry? Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Yes, uh, in the zoning bylaws, there are um, the, the number and type of uh, projects or changes that are listed in uh, Section 3.1b uh, are exceed exceed the type of projects that are listed in the section of the town bylaw, which um, which are referred to in the good neighbor agreement. Uh, and if that if that's the case, um, I'm wondering whether the putting this into the bylaw is incorporating the definitions in uh, six seven of the of the regular bylaws. Uh, Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. It's a good question. Um, the, the reason for voting no action was due to the inconsistency rather than looking to uh, necessarily create consistency as it was a feeling of the Redevelopment Board that it, we agree that the Good Neighbor Act is important and should be enforced. Um, however, the scope of the article was not necessarily to create an expansion of the uh, types of projects that it covers, but rather re related to enforcement. And so the recommendation was to work um, in a future town meeting to, uh, to revise the, the Good Neighbor Act that's already in the existing town bylaw rather than add the circular uh, reference, which is currently not in conformance. Mr. Moderator, I wondered at this point, I think that I kind of agree with Mr. Schlickman. I'm skeptical as to whether or not there would be a practical problem created by the mismatches in language that the re redevelopment board has, has referred to. Um, that may be the case, but I think it is much more likely the case that as the language of the amendment indicates, uh, the applicable definitions are the definitions that are already in the uh, in the uh, bylaw in Article 6. Uh, I do think that the accusations of under enforcement are not adequately shown. We could probably have done a little better if we had been, we weren't really looking at the survey from this point of view, uh, but it might have been possible to at least identify some examples of systematic non enforcement. Uh, but I think the evidence before us is not nearly strong enough. Uh, to conclude that there's any substantial amount of non-enforcement. Nevertheless, I think it is important that the community uh, be assured 
uh, that uh, this is being enforced and if this would increase the confidence of the community in uh, that in, in, in the enforcement. Uh, I'm not sure it would make any real difference if we knew all of the exact cases, um, but I don't see the harm that it does, and I think it does con contribute to um, alleviating a concern that many people have, whether it's justified or not. So I'm going to vote in favor of this. Very good, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Elizabeth Pyle. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. This is Elizabeth Pyle, Precinct 10. I was a member of the residential study group that put forth the Good Neighbor Agreement. I think that this amendment is a welcome addition and it's really just inserting a cross-reference to the zoning bylaw that will help boost enforcement and I think if you want the good neighbor agreement enforced, that this is a good step in the right direction and that it can only help matters. And I will be voting for the article and I urge my fellow town meeting members to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Kristen Penarum. Unmute. Kristen Penarun, Precinct 20. We're getting closer with the pronunciation. So I want to speak in favor of this substitute motion, the presented amendment to Article 17. I would characterize myself as generally in support of redevelopment in town. I love seeing new construction, renovations, taking shape all over town. The rate of work, the pace of change does not concern me. We all want the good neighbor agreement to be working for us. But I really, I could not be more strongly in favor of the amendment and I appreciate Mr. Rudiman's efforts on this point to bring this forward in its amended form now because I think we need it now. I do also appreciate um, the efforts that inspectional services have been making to ensure that good neighbor is enforced, but I wanna share uh, a few more data points since we've been talking about the paucity of data with regard to violations. I live in Arlington Heights near Dunkin' Donuts, and over the past two years or so, my family has enjoyed three major long-term renovation projects within a few meters of my home. One was a gut renovation of our direct neighbor, the property abuts mine. The other two were not abutting properties, but they were so close to my property that I had to double check the boundary lines on our town's awesome user-friendly GIS map to see whether they were or were not abutters. I, um, did not go on a records retrieval request, but I am near certain that we were not notified of any of these construction projects in compliance with the Good Neighbor Agreement. And I want to make the point that uh, the construction proceeded apace, the noise and disturbance were reasonable, the projects were fun projects, but this anecdote makes a really good point. We as a community are not enforcing the Good Neighbor Agreement as we need to be. I think that any action in support of such enforcement is an action worth taking now and the amended article 17 is timely, so I think we should vote yes on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Penarum. Um, <clears throat> Pete, Peter Howard? <laughs> Peter, um, you or Jane have to turn off your speaker because we're getting pretty bad feedback. So go ahead and unmute and try again. I guess Pete's gonna give it one more try. Pass. Pass. Okay. <laughs> he passes. Um, Susan Stamps. Hi, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. <clears throat> I'm confused as to, to the need for this article. 
Uh, this reminds me of the tree bylaw, um, which um, as a member of the tree committee, we passed a few years ago. And it's the same sort of thing where uh, before there can be any construction on property, um, if there are any protected trees on the property, there has to be a tree plan presented and approved by the tree warden. Um, and, there can, and there can be no construction on the property ahead of time. It doesn't mention a building and permit can't be issued. It seemed at the time we were passing it and spoke with inspectional services that we really didn't have to go that route. We have not had a problem enforcing the tree bylaw. Um, it's true, we do have a good sheriff in town and, um, by the name of Tim Laqueeve, our tree warden, so he knows what's going on. But yet, still, um, I've, I'm, I've been reading Article 7, the Good Neighbor Agreement bylaw, as the discussion has been going on tonight. And it states quite clearly that there has to be notice given um, prior to excavation, et cetera, and that, um, no, and that violation, um, it says prior to issuance of a demolition or building permit or commencing an open foundation excavation, et cetera, the applicant shall demonstrate to the satisfaction, satisfaction of the building inspector um, that they have given the notice required herein by providing a list of those notified, a copy of the notice and an affidavit stating that it was mailed. I guess I'm hearing tonight that that's not happening. The bylaw couldn't be clearer. Um, why isn't it happening? It seems to me this is not an issue of we need more verbiage in a bylaw that's not even the good neighbor bylaw, it's a zoning bylaw. And the issue is um, enforcement. And so I think that our um, building inspector, Mike Byrne, just said a few minutes ago that they do have a checklist, um, which they go through before they issue a building permit. So I'm, I'm mystified as to why uh, there isn't compliance with the good neighbor agreement. But if the it seems like compliance is the problem, and it seems like it is an easily solvable problem if um, town council and the town manager and whoever else needs to get involved to make sure it gets done. So I'm voting no on this article. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, it's um, 11.58. Move to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. We have a motion to adjourn. It's been sec seconded by Ms. Brazil. Second. And uh, we can direct the clerk to enter one, one vote in order in favor of the motion to adjourn. So we're going to come back on Wednesday. Um, looking through, we're pretty close to the end. If we um, have a couple no actions after this and then just a couple more articles, we should be able to finish up Wednesday if we're um, pretty efficient and we move through the articles that are left. All right, thank you all very much. Mr. Moderator, we'll see you on Wednesday. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. Um, any motions to reconsider? Yeah, I was just about to say that I realized that right as I was wrapping up. Uh, are there any motions to reconsider? If anyone has a motion to reconsider, please use the um, point of order or um, add a. Um, yeah, please use the raised hand feature on Zoom right now if you have a point of uh, motion for reconsideration. So if any has a motion for reconsideration, uh, Sandra Mustejo, maybe she has a point of order, uh, motion notice of reconsideration. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sandra Mustejo, Precinct 16. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, reconsider. Also, I would just like to point which, out- Which article? Uh, Article 17. Oh, we um, haven't voted on it yet. So you can't reconsider something we haven't I'm voted on. I'm sorry, I, I should say, I really wanted to just point out that you said it was 11.58 and then it is 10.58. Yeah, I'm tired. It's <laughs> 11 o'clock now, <laughs> thank you. So well, a motion to reconsideration on any of the articles that we made final votes on this evening. Okay. Anyone I'm has sorry. any of those, please uh, let us know right now. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Stejo. Seeing none, uh, 
Okay. Thank you all very much. We'll see you Wednesday night.